Hi, and welcome back to another weekly GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on the show this week, we talk a little bit about bikes getting a bit long. We check out some new prototype bikes coming from GT and another potential for Mondraker. And we also have a look at a very cool Canadian brand called Rollingdale Cycles. Okay, are bikes getting a bit long? Are people getting a bit carried away with this? So in the last 10 years, undoubtedly bikes have progressed massively. You're talking in terms of geometry, in terms of componentry, and of course, they're getting longer as well. If you go back 20 years ago though, you're talking bikes are gonna be less than a thousand millimeters in their wheelbase. And head angle, you're talking in the 70s, like pretty steep stuff, which would be quite horrendous on today's type of terrain. Thankfully, a decade ago, Nukeproof and other forward-thinking brands started bringing in some longer geometry that was a bit more refined, a bit more aimed at what people were actually starting to do on mountain bikes. So the Mega came out in around 2012, had 26-inch wheels, and it was like 140 on the rear, 160 on the front, 65 degree head angle, 1,174 mil wheelbase on there. Pretty aggressive for the time, actually. I remember it coming out thinking, man, that thing is like very specific. Uh, obviously, it was named after the Mega for a good reason. Skipping onto the modern day equivalent of the bike, though, and yeah, it's kind of more of the same. So, 27 and a half inch wheels and 29 inch wheel options. It's about 100 mil longer in the wheelbase, so yeah, it's definitely got longer. It's a degree slacker, so it's a bit more aggressive. And really, that's kind of where a lot of hard riding enduro bikes and the trail bikes are kind of sitting in the 64 degree head angle, you know, 1,200 mil or so wheelbase there with a choice of wheel sizes. It's sitting pretty good. However, some manufacturers are still pushing to go longer still in search of the ultimate bike for really rowdy terrain. Geometron make a bike called the G16, and in their longest setting and the longest size, it's over 1,350 millimeters, which is just colossal. It's like a barge, that thing. And head angle, 62 and a half degrees. Super slack. I don't think you could ride that no-handed on the flat without the wheel flopping over, but I bet that thing goes like a train when you're pointing it down the side of a mountain. So why exactly would you want a longer bike then? Well, the first thing is speed. Faster things handle better when they're longer, okay? So you're pointing a bike down a mountain, you're naturally gonna go faster. The longer the wheelbase is, within reason, you're gonna feel a lot more stable. Combined with a slack head angle, the front wheel is gonna feel further out in front of you. It's gonna be attacking things head on down the side of a mountain. You're not gonna feel pitched over the bars like you can on a shorter, steeper bike. The bike essentially is coming to life in an element it's absolutely designed for. It's gonna rail down the side of a mountain. Just think about the support and stability you can have by being a bit more neutral on the bike instead of hanging on for dear life. But it's not just about how the bike feels, it's actually about what a long, slack bike can do for the rider. Now think about what EWS racers have to contend with. They're riding massive days out in the mountains. We're talking real mountain tracks here. And really, if they've got to wrestle a bike down a terrain, that's something that's actually gonna hamper their riding. What they're looking for is something that's very stable, very secure, and very predictable. They take that out of the equation then, and they can focus on the sheer physical effort that they have to do to achieve what they need to in racing at that level. And yeah, you can't beat a bike like that for terrain like that. But the fact is, how many people, how many of you out there actually need a bike like that or ride terrain that requires a bike to be like that? Let's face it, most of us are quite happy smashing through berms down the woods where, let's face it, a shorter bike, maybe even a bike with smaller wheels, is gonna feel more fun. And surely it's all about fun. Yeah, some of you I know will, you know, Strava hunters out there love the speed element and that is your fun. Other people want that good feeling of, you know, slightly flatter terrain, riding a short bike, it's gonna come to life. If you're gonna ride a long bike like that on the flatter terrain, it's just holding you back from all that fun you can have. Now, I'm sure that mountain bike manufacturers are putting longer and longer bikes out there, but where's it gonna stop? Are bikes getting too long? I'd love to know what you think. Let us know in those comments underneath. Okay, so now diving into news, there's plenty to talk about this week, including some new things we spotted hovering around online. Now, the first one is what appears to be a new GT sanction. So there's a few shots buzzing up on screen in a few different ways here. So the first is, uh, well, Martin Mays and of course, uh, Noga Karem, they've been riding what looks like a high pivot version of a sanction uh, or a scaled down GT Fury, whichever way you wanna, wanna think about it. Uh, but Wind Masters has also been spotted on it. So Martin Noga have been seen using a Fox 36 and a Fox 38, both of bottle cages on their bikes. But Wynn has been seen with a twin crown Fox 40 on there, but also running 
a uh, bottle case. So could that mean that he's running the same bike for enduro as well as downhill stuff? It means the bike can handle the strain of a Twin Crown fork and potentially the travel of it as well. So certainly interesting things coming. And I, I love the fact that GT kind of started with a high pivot bike to start with, with the RTS way back in the day. Then they went to the LTS, which was a four bar system. Then they developed their high pivot bikes, which were the uh, iDrive independent drivetrain system. Now they've come full circle using a high pivot bike with an idler wheel, but it's also uh, a four bar linkage design on the rear. So actually, they could be the best they've ever made. Uh, really interesting stuff, and I think there's gonna be some good stuff coming from GT. Uh, it's nice to have them kind of back on the scene. Uh, I've always liked GT. What do you think? Anyone out there a GT fan, or do they kind of go under the radar a bit? Moving on to next bit of news, Mondraker have got a new bike. Now, I don't know if anyone remembers, but when they launched their alloy version of the Summum recently, well, the last year, year before, I actually completely lose track of when it was. But I think one of the things Mondraker said was, uh, our riders prefer the alloy feel and it's a better application for the racing and this and that. Isn't it funny though, how all manufacturers, if you're making a carbon bike, carbon is the best. It's definitely the best, nothing's better. If you've got an alloy bike, no, 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 we prefer alloy. Alloy definitely works better for us, it's better for the riders, the racers give us all their feedback. Um, and it seems to be like, oh no, hold on, sorry. 2020 was best for alloy. Now it's 2021, so it's carbon again. Oh, is it gonna be back to alloy next year? Who knows, but uh, either way, this bike has been spotted. Sorry about the long way around there. And it's gotta be carbon. So it looks like a prototype. Some of them, it looks like it's full carbon. And look at how top tube, it's like a blade on it. So there's a few shots we've seen poking around. I think this one might be Laurie Greenland's shot. He actually posted a story and had the bike blurred out, suggesting that uh, it wasn't supposed to be seen. So it has been around in a few shots, but uh, either way, Mondra can make some of the finest looking carbon bikes. So when that comes out, or you know, it might just be a prototype, who knows? Um, I expect that is gonna be an absolute weapon of a bike. It'll be ultra light, ultra stiff, uh, and exactly what it needs to be. But uh, isn't it funny how, you know, each year, you know, one of the materials is, you know, making a comeback, you know, Trek with the alloy bike recently, now you've seen this one as well. But uh, hey, hey ho, that's what makes the world goes around, isn't it? Right, next up then, loads of stuff from Fox. So Fox suspension, we've got a 2022 range, and the range is colossal. We're not gonna talk about all of it, but the 34, the DPX2, and the DHX. Right, so starting with the 34 on screen now, so a bit of a structure change to the fork, so a bit of a new layout. So you notice it's got the round archway on there like you've seen on the 36 and the 38, which launched last year. Now this is a better system, it's stronger, it's stiffer, but more importantly, rather than just the look of it, is they've designed it like this for a reason. So if you look at it from the side profile, it steps forwards quite a lot. Now you might be noticing that people are going for short and shorter offset on their fork crowns, which means under compression, if you've got a big heavy duty frame, maybe the 1.5 head tube or carbon, that brace can contact with the front of the frame. So they've stepped it forwards to allow running even the, you know, even uh, the most minimal in terms of fork offset with the crown there, and you're not gonna get any chance of that brace hitting the frame. And now that's the same from the 34, 36, and the 38. So that is a very welcome addition. And I, for one, love that round archway. When it first showed up and I got a pair of the 36s out of the box, I was like, ooh, I'm not sure about this but as soon as I held it up against the previous uh, 36, which had the quite square angular archway, um, well, less of an archway, but uh, you know what I mean, a brace, I found that, that looked quite old by comparison. So I think this is a welcome addition uh, and it's obviously here to stay. So on the 34, you've now got, the regular 34 is 100 to 120 mil travel, sorry, 120 to 140 mil travel. The step cast version, which is the super lightweight cross country one, that is this one on screen. That is 100 to 120 mil travel. Now the forks, a glance, look fairly similar other than on the step cast, you've obviously got the, uh, the profiled lowers where they stripped off all that material. The internals are slightly different. So we'll do 34 first. 120 to 140 mil travel, 44 and 51 mil offsets on there. It's got a new 58 mil crown diameter, so it's a nice, strong, burly crown on there. A bit more support than previous models, which some people, I think, criticize for saying they're a little bit flexy under braking. No more. Uh, the lower leg, interestingly, has these cool bypass channels. I'm not sure if you can see them in this shop, but it's a weird little channel profile that you can see on those lower legs. It's there for a couple of reasons. The first one is to help atmospherically balance the fork. Uh, any air that gets built up just under compression for ingesting through the seals, that can actually limit you getting full travel, make the fork feel harsh. So they're there basically to help bypass that. You might notice on the bigger 36 and 38, they've actually got bleed valves. So anything that builds up there, 
bearing in mind though, that's not going to happen on your regular riding. That's going to happen like on a 45 minute like enduro stage or something like that. Um, that's why they don't need it on the 34. But an upside of these channels is the oil from the lower leg uh, fluid basically to lubricate the bushes is free to migrate a bit easier than not just having a capillary action there to actually keep things lubed. So they should feel technically, at least on paper, a lot smoother. So that's a welcome addition. Uh, they've got the grip two damper returns, of course, with a variable valve control on the 34. You don't get that on the step cast model. You only get the fit four and the regular grip damper. So if you want the grip two, you've got to have the slightly heavier fork, but it is such a good damper. It's really, really good. They've nailed that. Uh, all the usual stuff with the Evo spring, blah, blah, blah. Um, weights from 1,698 grams. Bear in mind, it comes in different wheel sizes. Pricing in US dollars, 769 to 969. And in euros, that's 1069 to 1389. And then, of course, there's the step cast model 100 to 120 mil travel, fit four grip models, a fit four and grip models, 1496 grams. So, a fair bit lighter there. And that's really like the XC, sort of the rowdy XC fork there. Um, I've got one of the older versions on a bike and I love it. So, the new one, well, that's going to be better, isn't it? Um, MSRP, so US dollars is 849 up to 1089 and euros is 1129 to 1459. But as we're all too wet at the moment, pricing is kind of a bit all over the place with uh, various reasons going on in the world. Right, next up, DPX2. This one's exciting. So it's an all new body on this shock. So I have got one floating around somewhere, an older one, and it does look quite old. Now, I've looked, you know, at a glance, it doesn't look that much different. So here is that fresh one. It looks a lot different to the, you know, when you look up close. So it's got a whole bunch of new things. So a new body, new damper, smaller increment volume spaces, which is great for fine tuning. Because I, I found actually in some of the volume spaces, the step's a bit big. You can get a bit too much harshness out of them if you put the bigger ones in. So being able to incrementally step that up more, more adjustment in a finer way. It's got to be better. MCU uh, microcellular urethane, that is to you, I mean, bottom out bumper. Sounds a bit like 1990s technology, doesn't it? But, uh, but it works for good reason. It's a, basically a hard rubber stop for when you actually smash through that travel. So you won't get a nasty metal to metal clunk, even if you like it to feel quite linear. Uh, so that's quite good. It's got hydraulic uh, top out, so the opposite in there. Low speed compression, independent firm mode. So that's basically a climb switch to you and me, uh, two position on there. Um, and you can obviously adjust the amount of low speed compression that you have. Adjustable rebound on there. Optimized reservoir size per size. So the longer stroke shocks will naturally have a bigger piggyback reservoir with more oil for more consistency. So that's a great thing to have in there. Kind of looking at frame geometry for inspiration there. Um, and it's got a larger F sleeve. So this is probably the single biggest thing of all of them. It reduces the overall pressure that the average rider will put in. And they say by 40 PSI compared to the previous. DPX2. So that's super good if you're a heavier rider and you're lacking being able to get enough air pressure in the shock to support your weight. So if you're on the heavier side, this could be amazing for you. But also the fact it reduces. So technically I should reduce 40 psi in the shock compared to what I normally do. That should make the shock feel absolutely amazing on the small stuff. So fair play to Fox. I look forward to trying one. Uh, and also the air valve location is improved so it suits more frame size. Of course, getting a shoehorning in a piggyback shot can be quite tricky into a frame, uh, but all good stuff. So US dollars, 499 to 569, so not bad value at all. And 699 to 799 in euros, great stuff. And then finally, the DHX. This is a trail shock. This is not the DHX2. So it's not their downhill shock. It's a trail coil shock. Yeah, I reckon everyone's going to want to buy this shock. So all new body and damper, um, low speed compression, a firm mode switch on there, which is really cool. Uh, MCU bottom out, hydraulic top out on there. The preload collar is indented on there, so you can count your preload clicks. Brilliant, rather than just totally guessing or forgetting when you're screwing it on. And then the spring retainer is all the way around, rather than being a C-clip, so it supports the spring a lot better. Uh, really cool stuff. And there's also a scuff guard on the body, which is a nice touch. Uh, so obviously springs can move slightly and take the paint off the main body of the shock. So built in, brilliant stuff. I reckon that shot is gonna be a hot tip. Uh, 549 US dollars and 759 in euros. Awesome stuff there from Fox. Knocking it out of the park. And I'd nearly forgotten, there is one more thing in news. Uh, Willie A Bikes, who are renowned in the uh, Italian road bike industry, they make beautiful road bikes. They're now entering the performance mountain bike realm. So they've already had a few mountain bikes in the past, but nothing quite like this. So this is their new Urta SLR. So it's an XCO level, proper XC World Cup style race frame. Now this thing looks fast, really slender lines, clearly borrowing a lot of styling 
from their road and well, their iconic road bikes. Uh, there's a couple of different colorway options available. There's the red and blue, which looks fast and looks very Italian looking, but I've got to say, the black version, this one here, look at that thing. Now, the top tube on that is nice and slender, and like that seat mask, it's almost like a blade. Uh, there is one floating around at work. I know that Rich Payne has had his eyes on it, so I expect he's probably gonna do something with it at some point. So keep an eye out over on GMBN. Uh, but a little bit of information about the bike. So there's a bunch of images flying up on screen. So it's a full carbon design, taking inspiration from their road range. And of course, the actual carbon itself shares the same, uh, the same exact carbon. So it's the Huss Modulus carbon, which they use already on their road frames. It's proven technology. It's got a UDH dropout on the rear, which I'm pleased to see. I think all manufacturers are really starting to adopt that. So in case you don't know about that, it's the universal derailleur hanger developed by SRAM, but it's open license. So anyone can use this and it's really gonna simplify things in future. When you do break a mech hanger, there's only gonna be one that you need to just plug into your bike. Brilliant piece of kit, that. So it's a single pivot design with a linkage driven shock uh, and with what appears to be a flex stays on the rear. Very similar, in fact, to the Canyon Lux in the way that it operates. Uh, and the Canyon's incredibly supple, so I'd imagine that these, this Erta feels fairly similar. And the geometry, in fact, is fairly similar too. So there's four sizes, ranging from small through to extra large. Now, reach on those sizes is from 400 to 480, so I think the Lux is about 480 in the extra large there. Head angle, 69 degrees, seat angle, 74 degrees, chainstay, 432. Wheelbase 1088 to 1175. So really similar geometry. And if you look at some of the top cross-country race bikes around, they all share fairly similar stats. I mean, some bikes are starting to get more extreme. This is a bit more traditional, but it's gonna sit right in with where the market is now. So actually, it should prove pretty popular. And if you've actually got a Willier road bike, well, it's the perfect partnership to, uh, to add to your stable and obviously convince you to ride mountain bikes instead of road bikes, but, um, but here we go. Right, so there's also a one-piece carbon bar on the design as well. So we've seen this before, uh, the Hickson bar from Syncross, we first saw it. Canyon are also doing their own one-piece bar. And now you get the Willier one, which looks really nice. So there's three stem lengths or stem length equivalents because of the fact the bar sweeps forward and backwards, uh, effectively looking like it's got a shorter stem than it has. So 60, 75 and 90 mil equivalents. It's a 460 mil width and it's got a four degree up sweep and an eight degree back sweep. So if those numbers suit you, you're gonna love the bar because it's ultra light, it looks really cool and it's super comfortable. Uh, they start to become really popular with those cross country race heads. Of course, that's not gonna be to everyone's taste. Some people might want a wider bar or a bar with sweep, uh, up rise, things like that. But Look at the thing, it looks absolutely beautiful. So a few more shots on the screen of the bike, buzzing past you now. And retail prices are from 5,400 euros up to 10,000 euros. So they are not messing around. They're coming in to make a statement with this bike. You don't just sort of drip feed a bit of technology into the scene and then go bang in with a big one like this for no reason. So I expect there's gonna be more stuff to come from Willie A Bikes. And uh, well, certainly like what I'm seeing so far from this race bike. And I think it's the right way to come into mountain biking using that technology at the top end in the race bike in the cross country format. Uh, what do you think about road brands coming into mountain biking? I think it's kind of cool. We've seen it before. We've seen Bianchi bikes do it. Of course, Canyon make road bikes as well as mountain bikes, although they're not really a road brand, but they do that very well. Um, and there's gonna be a bunch of others, of course, in the pedals world, there's look pedals, there's a whole bunch, there's time as well. There's loads coming into the mountain bike world. So perhaps we'll do a piece on road brands that have come into mountain biking and making it work, because there's a lot of them, probably more than you think. Anyway, let us know what you think in the comments underneath. Okay, so let's dive into comments from last week's show, and there's some pretty good ones here. So uh, first up, the cracks me up, is from Ethan Thomas. As an Australian, I nearly spat my drink out when he described the bin chicken as graceful. So uh, yeah, I think you probably think it disgraceful, undoubtedly. So I never knew about the whole bin chicken thing until someone commented off the back of a previous thing about Ibis. And I actually felt quite bad because I asked Scott Nickel Ibis if he knew about the bin, bin chicken reference and he just replied with, yes, full stop, and sent the email. So sorry, Scott, but uh, it is pretty funny. And next one's from Mods on Bikes. Finally, the industry is catching up with the K9DH001. So ahead of the competition at the time and a total beast. Hey, short story for you here. So the guy that designed that bike, Louis Array, he actually designed the GT Fury with the high pivot. See where that came from, can't you? Um, next one is from Rodrigo Grass. Doddy, for the sake of science, I need you to put Blake on a mullet 2629. How good would that be? Yep, 100% we'll do that. Well, why stop at 26? Why don't you put a 24 on the back? I'm sure Blake would be up for that, wouldn't he? 
Uh, next comments are from the Downhill Bike Explainer video. James says, the bike that everyone loves and wants, but they won't use as nearly as much as they should. Absolutely, I think, yeah, like I said in the video, I think they're probably the coolest of all the mountain bikes, but probably the least applicable for virtually everyone. But yeah, there's nothing better, I think, than seeing one of those things properly flying under the right rider, no doubt. Uh, Tony Yu says, it's a proven fact, if you have a double crown fork, it makes you 10% faster. Well, I think maybe it definitely does in your head, uh, it definitely does in my head, when, when I used to ride one of those things. But yeah, I mean, they just look cool, don't they, more importantly. And um, you know, let's face it, superficially. Uh, next one's from Connor Campbell. Do a what is a slope style bike episode next? Um, actually, I've had a few people comment on the back of that video if we can do them for all styles of bikes. So yeah, no problem. We'll do cross country bike, we'll do down country bike, we'll do slope style bikes, dirt jump bike, we'll do every kind of category. So there's kind of like a bit of a log of information for people out there that might not know all the details on the bikes. Um, not sure which one to do next. Well, you said slope style bike, so maybe I'll do that one next. Thanks for the comments. <laughs> Okay, now it's time to go back in time, uh, rewind. Get to talk about old retro mountain bike stuff. If you've got anything retro, send it in. There's a link right there, and there's another one in the description underneath. You can click it, and it'll take you through to our uploader. Super simple, but please don't forget to tell us who you are, where you're from, and what you're actually sending in, or what you want to know. Uh, you'd be amazed how many people actually forget that. You just send us images, and we don't know what to do with them. Starting this week, though, is a classic. I think I referenced this bike in a video recently and it's brought back memories. The Blood Red Specialized Big Hit 2002. I had this very frame with an MRP on it, just like yours. In fact, I think I had the same wheels on that and also the shiver forks as well. Man, those things are incredible. So this is from Craig in Swansea. Back in 2020, I parted ways with my beloved Big Hit. So I needed something that could get up the hills as well as down. The bike was nearly original, along with old gold V12 mags on there and MRP bash guard, race face cranks, Hope DH4 brakes all the way around. Um, I was looking at it for ages and it did suffer a bad winter in the leaking shed, but it always put a smile on my face. It was an animal if you pointed it down a mountain. Still sad to not see it in a bike cave. I'll tell you what, it's a pretty good specimen. Um, if you have sold that and people are looking for the uh, new MRP rollers, my retro contact, Jamie Lynn from Mountain Mania Cycles, he paid for MRP to open the mold up again to make those. So he's got a load of those for sale uh, without the bearings. You have to put your own bearings in as far as I know. So get in touch with Jamie at Mountain Mania Cycles and he should hopefully be able to help you out. He's got loads of those things as far as I know. But that bike was unbelievable until you rode it into a big bump and that tiny little 24 inch wheel would just be like, <coughs> just kick you. But it did look really cool. And the Shiver inverted fork. Man, those things, yes, they were bendy, but they worked so nicely. Gutted, gutted. I had that fork, I had that bike. The bike's long gone, but the fork I took off and I was gonna put it on something else and I actually don't even remember what happened to it. But look how dated it is. So it's got 135 mil back end with a quick release on a bike like that with what, eight inch travel? That's mental, isn't it? But pretty cool. And look how steep the head angle looks on it. It just looks, it looks old now, really seeing it. And a cool little fe feature on the front there, you've got the Azonic Hammer stem. So that was the first sort of inline stem made by anyone that wasn't uh, mounted onto the top crown and fork. Pretty similar to the forward geometry stem that Mondraker later came out with that's like one of those bad boys, but that was obviously quite a bit more refined. But uh, but cool stuff to see. What else we've got in Rewind? Oh, I forgot, it's another big hit. So uh, this one's from 2003. Uh, this one's in Newcastle upon Tyne from Danny. My old big hit from back in the day, I really miss that bike. It does feel, from what people said in the comments, people have got a bit of nostalgia about the old Big Hit bike. There must be a few more of you out there that have got Big Hits. If you have, please show us the pictures, get involved on our social media or in the comments and tell us what you got. But this one's cool, you've got the Sun MTX rims. So early on when the Specialized Big Hit came out, it was a real struggle to get the 24 inch rear wheels uh, and the right tyre. So I, I think I ran an intense tyre system on there with a three inch rear tyre that was so big and so, and I think I had the Sun double track rim, couldn't actually get the tire off. It was a four ply tire, like just the thickest thing ever. And as far as I remember, I left it in the old MBK workshop because it was just like, couldn't do anything with it. You'd never get a puncture on that. You could ride that into any size curb you want and you would just laugh at it. But uh, mega cool stuff. Nice set of boxes on there, nice cool shock on the rear. Another set of Hope brakes. Early Maxxis high roller tire on the front. Looking good, awesome stuff, guys. Right, next up is from Shenandoah, and this is a 1995 Proflex 855 World Cup Series. 
Man, when that bike came out, that felt so ahead of the curve. Look at it now. It looks like a bit of a joke, doesn't it, compared to what we have today. So you've got the, the Gervin Vector fork in the front, so a leading link fork. Pretty cool, actually, back in the day when it came out. And on the rear end, you've got uh, a fairly high pivot, really, for a single pivot there. So I'd imagine you would have noticed that in some of the gears. But kind of still quite cool, I think. Quite classic Proflex colours. The bright red front triangle, polished rear end, yellow elastomer shock. So that was another whole selling point. They didn't have coil springs or air as a suspension method. They had elastom elastomer rubber, which actually had friction damping as part of it. Uh, not too good though when you rode in extreme cold or extreme heat because you change characteristics of the bike, but um, pretty cool to see. And last one, got some massive effort this week, is a Rocky Mountain RM9. Doesn't that just make you think of Wade Simmons dropping off massive stuff? Super cool. Uh, actually, they rode not bad, those bikes, but I've got a feeling quite a few of them used to break, but um, doesn't matter when they look that good. And you've got boxes on yours, which is nice, but I can't help but feel that that bike should have a set of triple eights on it. Uh, it was that kind of bike. But uh, mega cool to see. Thank you for sending that one in, Daniel. Um, and that one's from South Germany. So a real selection of people from different places. Uh, keep them coming. We love this section of the show. Okay, now it's time for top mods. This is all about the modifications you do to your bike to make it a bit different or a bit better than your mate's bike. Uh, same thing applies as Rewind and Bike Cave. There's a link right here at the bottom of the screen. Get involved, send us your bikes, show us what you've done to them, show us how cool and how much you love your bike. Again, don't forget your name, where you're from, and what your bike is. So first one this week, in fact, there's not many this week because there's so many pictures from this first one. It's called Full Party Purple. This is from Grant in San Diego. I've tastefully accentuated the bike with more purple parts. So it's a 2021 Spectral AL, uh, 27 and a half inch wheels and this thing is fully decked out. So check this out. So you've got race face, turbine stem, one-up pedals, wheel decals on there, frame protection stickers from ground control, one-up bars, new GX access. Man, like you're absolutely decking this bike out. Um, I can't really read out what it says on that top tube, but I'm pretty sure we can put it on screen. Um, pretty cool decal, that one. Nice top, top cap on there. Even the fender on the front there is looking good. How are you getting on with that, the GX paddle, incidentally? I'd like to know what you think of that, because I ended up swapping mine, which I've preferred with the new rocker style paddle. Got on with it better, but actually, I'm considering going back. I'm still not completely decided, because I'm using it between two bikes. Um, as in, I've got access on one bike, and I've got conventional shifting on the other. Jumping between the two, I find it incredibly hard to get used to it. So I'd like to know if you're riding that as a sole bike, how you're, you know, how basically how you're getting on with it. Let us know in those comments if you're watching this. Dude, your bike looks awesome. It's really, really cool. Loving the purple. Um, I'm a bit biased because I've got a lot of purple stuff on my bike. That is a great shot. You should send this shot in with a cactus into a dirt shed for bike vault. I reckon that would get super nice all day long. Loving it. Right, next one's from Maximilian in Edinburgh. And this is an Orange Stage 5 2018 prototype. Right, so Orange Bikes, their prototype division, they put strange decals on the, dame, on the down tube in the same font as Orange. Basically, you always know if it's a it's a prototype bike or work in progress or a team bike. But uh, pretty cool, and this one looks really cool. Loving the gold chambering on there, the gold decals, even the brown saddle and the tan walls. You've got that kind of look just right, I think. I started this build in the first lockdown to upgrade for my 2009. Um, does that count as retro yet? No, it's just old, mate. Uh, 2009 Orange Five. I figured I could get by with just my hardtail for a while and take my time building the new to me stage five. It's an early prototype frame before Orange eventually settled on the solid swing arm design. Had to get new wheels, dropper post, fork, uh, and the new bike being the 29er. But uh, reused my Hope Tech M4 brakes, cockpit, SLX. Man, this is like, it's looking really good. I love the nod to the Lotus JPS Racing black and gold. Uh, it also matches my new GMBN t-shirt. Uh, actually, no, you say, not mine, you say, Matches the new GMBN t-shirt I've seen worn on the channel. You should probably have one then, shouldn't you? Get involved in our shop. There's a link hovering around somewhere and you can buy that very t-shirt. But uh, dude, your bike looks sick. I love it. Really good. I always mock one of my local rider friends for having an orange because here's one sounds like an old toolbox when you push it down a flight of stairs. But I also actually really quite like orange bikes. I like the fact they're still hand-built in England and it looks good. Nice bike, mate. Okay, that's it for this week's show. Hopefully you enjoyed everything. Let us know what you think in the comments and don't forget to let us know about the long bikes thing. Get involved in those comments and we'll pick it up next week. See you later.